Hi, everyone. Welcome. We'll just wait a few moments to make sure that everyone's in who wants to join and then we'll begin. We'll just wait a few more moments and then we can get started. All right, I think we can go ahead and begin and anyone else who wants to join us uh, is welcome to enter at any point. Uh, welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm Abby Burke, uh, Open Rights Group's Policy Manager for Data Protection, and I'll be chairing this Zoom event tonight. For those who may be newer to ORG's work, ORG was founded in 2005 and is a UK-based digital campaigning organization working to protect our rights to privacy and free speech online. We do this through campaigning, legal action, policy interventions, and more. Um, and ORG was really pleased to publish our report titled Data Privacy and the Information Commissioner's Office During a Crisis, Lessons Learned During the COVID-19 Pandemic. Uh, the report found that the ICO failed to take action over clear breaches of data protection law by the UK government, an analysis of three key pandemic programs, found that the programs were riddled with data protection issues, including late or missing DPIAs, excessive data retention periods, and the involvement of private companies without proper safeguards and oversight. And these findings come at a time when the government is trying to weaken data protection in the UK through the Data Protection and Digital Information Bill that's currently in the House of Commons. And if passed, civil society believes that the bill would exacerbate current issues with data protection uh, particularly with health data by weakening data rights, further politicizing the ICO, and providing more leeway for the government and corporations to share and reuse data. So that's why it's so critical that we're here tonight having this conversation about the report and our findings. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic called for the use of public health data on a massive scale during an emergency situation so it's really important for us to look back and assess how the government, our regulatory bodies, and corporations handled the responsibility and trust that were placed in them by the public. So we have two great speakers tonight, Martin Blanchard from Keep Our NHS Public and Mariano Delisanti, who's the legal and policy officer at Open Rights Group, and he co-authored the report. Um, we'll also be taking some audience questions as well, so feel free to pop those in the chat or leave a comment if you're watching on the YouTube live stream, and we'll try to get through as many as we can tonight. So Martin is up first, and he'll be talking about the importance of trust for public health programs, privacy, and the use of data by the NHS. Uh, Martin is a retired academic psychiatrist and NHS consultant, and through this work has lots of personal experience with healthcare work that handles personal data. Uh, he's been a member of Keep Our NHS Public since 2017 and has been a chair of the working group on data there since 2021. Um, and for those who may not be familiar with Keep Our NHS Public, they're a non-party political organization that campaigns against the privatization and underfunding of the NHS. Uh, Martin, thank you for joining us. I'm really excited to hear your talk and I'll hand it over to you now for your presentation. Thank, thanks very much indeed. I'll just share my, my screen and share and there there okay thanks very much right first of all i'd like to thank org i normally say org but org for asking me to talk briefly about trust the use of our personal health data 
healthcare and harm. In this brief talk, I'll try to cover public lack of trust in government and tech companies, the former's association with harm, and suggested reasons why there is this public lack of trust. Now, this information is from The Lancet uh, 2020, comparing people's willingness to share anonymized personal data to various entities in the UK and the USA. Now, while people are generally happy to share with medical practitioners, they're not keen to share their data with government or tech companies, even for improvement of healthcare, and certainly not for commercial use. An earlier 2018 KPMG report to the UK government demonstrated a similar problem of lack of trust, which, if not addressed, it was felt, would hinder any ambition to become an AI superpower, the thing that this government has pronounced that it wishes to do. This slide has results of interest from two studies. The top one is on attitudes towards the NHS app measured before and after its release. Lack of trust seemed to be a significant barrier to acceptance of both the idea of and the actual digital contact tracing app. And it seemed that concerns about the intentions of official bodies or corporations could be transfer transferred to the intention for the use of the app. And although the NHS was trusted significantly more positively than any other institution, the level of trust in the app was strongly related to level of trust in the government, local councils, and big technology, which were all at very low levels. The second study is the 2022 Lancet paper, Contextual Factors Associated with COVID Infection and Fatality in 177 countries, a huge study. They looked at a host of variables. Many had no association and many were difficult or impossible to do much about. But of interest is the remediable finding amongst the social indicators that greater trust in government was associated with significantly decreased infection rates and in middle to high income countries with greater vaccination coverage. It was suggested that if every nation trusted its government to the level of Denmark, a high performer at the 75th percentile on trust, global COVID-19 infections would have been 13% lower. So what is it that makes us worry so much about sharing our personal health data with our government and some of its institutions and partners? Well, they keep trying to take personal data without informing us, and they move it around as pseudonymized or de-identified data, which is not anonymized, so it does not fall out of the need for protection in law. There was the care data episode from 2013 to 2016, and then the GP data grab in, in 2021. There have also been hundreds of data sharing agreement breaches, which have not been punished. And indeed, the leading expert, Ben Goldacre, opted out of the GP data grab because he knows how easily pseudonymized or de-identified data can be re-identified and him being in the public eye. The NHS already share, sell our data in most cases without us knowing. This is well-known work by MedConfidential, analyzing information from the NHS Digital Release Register. And there's also been a publication along similar lines in the Financial Times in 2021. The blue numbers are the number of, of releases uh, over this pre-pandemic timeframe. So this is, this is not using emergency powers or that there's any horrible pandemic going on. They found that more than 43 commercial companies have received patient data sets, which is 13% of the total recipients of data. And companies include very familiar ones such as McKinsey, KPMG, Rand Corporation, United Health, Optum, a whole load of them. Now, 
This is again from Med Confidential, and it appears that data is often shared or sold on by those on the register who act as data intermediaries. For example, if you go to the Harvey Walsh website, they claim to be the sole data controllers of hospital episode statistics, which are sent to them monthly by the NHS. And there is a lack of any audit trail beyond the registered companies and national data opt-outs are often not honored. Moving on to data and service transformation related issues. Kingsley Manning, ex-chair of NHS Digital, has stated in a letter to the BMJ that the merger of NHS Digital with NHS England, which has now occurred, is a grave error, especially given the government's intention to weaken constraints on the use of patient data. He points out that NHS England's priorities are often in conflict with the interests of patients, while their decisions on resource allocation are increasingly data-driven. Moreover, with the enhanced power of AI and access to ever more data sets, opaque algorithms can be used to decide whether or not to allow treatment, for example, a particular drug therapy, without the requirement to explain to a patient how this has been decided. Additionally, NHS England could be pressed to share and pool a patient's data with other public sector bodies to inform a wider range of decisions, for example, regarding criminal cases, welfare benefits, social care, employment, immigration, and so on. Not that that has not already happened. It has already happened. We know that the, the back room. And just to remind you, what NHS England will oversee, and that is 42 systems based on accountable care that government has decided was the way forward to achieve what they call sustainable health care. It's important to realize that as well as helping with the exciting medical science developments, data and algorithms are to be used throughout the systems to decide where the limited finance provided, they'll have a an annual lump sum virtually, is best spent to obtain best value for that system. This will mean moving money around so that some patient groups will get more or the same and others will get less state funded provision. Government have primarily used private companies through the health system support framework to set up, organize and help run the systems using our data. The systems are intended to continuously innovate and improve value into the future. Frequently, it seems in the media that government and a large number of MPs appear close to private companies and corporations. The Department of Health and Social Care has brought over 100 of them into the NHS and accredited them through the Health Services Support Framework. This is a sample of population intelligence suppliers. Those in red are known to have also bought their way into the new NHS, clearly for the opportunities offered. Opero Centene paid an unspecified amount to AT Medics to take over the primary care of 600,000 patients. Optum paid one and a half billion dollars for EMIS, whose software is used in primary and secondary care settings including electronic patient records for over 50% of our GP practices. Oracle paid $28 billion for Cerna, which has a global presence and NHS contracts across England. And in doing this, Oracle stated that healthcare is the largest and most important vertical market in the world, $3.8 trillion last year in the United States alone, and Cerna will be a huge additional revenue growth for Oracle for years to come as we expand its business into many more countries throughout the world. Another worry is the increasing amount of information from the United States about the number of corporate misconduct violations that appear to happen Here we have the uh, three corporations mentioned in the previous slide, 
And since the year 2000, United Health have had fines of $714 million, Oracle $578 million, and Centene $1.7 billion. Cases include, and I'm not attributing them to any of the companies in particular, and if you, please have a look at the violation tracker yourselves and, and see. The, Vols, the False Claims Act, Fraud, Anti-Competitive Practices, and the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Finally, there is, in my view, another reason which is recently reaching public awareness for us not to trust these large tech companies and our government if they allow it. To run our health systems will depend upon innovation. And this in turn requires knowledge, knowledge in, in an algorithmic context. New knowledge generation is an expensive thing to do, and it needs big data sets on which to run machine learning algorithms. It is the financial and technological resources of big tech companies that enables them to generate knowledge, and they can then own that knowledge through intellectual property rights. They can then lease that knowledge out for, for rent to smaller companies forming what they call corporate innovation systems. Or they can hold on to the knowledge to shape and control the developing health markets. This is what is called data-driven intellectual monopoly capitalism. And the market for such intangibles as this, as this knowledge is growing rapidly. Thus, access to our enormously valuable NHS database becomes a key requirement for them. This new knowledge system, as it develops, could produce a shift in power towards corporations with shareholders' interests legally as their first priority for any innovations that may be offered in our developing systems. Thank you. I think that's my 10 minutes. Thanks, Martin. That was really, really interesting. And I think everything that you just said really speaks volumes to why it's so important that we have a strong data protection regime and regulators in the UK that are promoting accountability and oversight of these systems. Um, next, I want to introduce Mariano, who will be going further into detail in the report and our findings. Uh, Mariano is the legal and policy officer at ORG, and he has supported ORG's strategic, strategic litigation and political advocacy efforts during the pandemic, uh, which includes two of the case studies that we have in the report, the UK contact tracing app and the uh, test and trace program. He also supported Oregon challenging ICO regulatory action policy and is currently working alongside our org colleagues to present amendments to the UK data protection changes that would ensure the independence of the ICO. So Mariano, thanks for being here and I'll pass it over to you to tell us more about the report and the findings that we had. Hi, so uh, thank you, Abby, and well, thank you everyone for taking the time to be here this evening. Uh, so what I was thinking about doing is to give a, a short overview of uh, how the um, report is structured and going into some of the findings and uh, analysis that we made in there. The interesting part will be later to connect this to the general uh, trends that we are seeing in data protection in the UK. You may be aware that there is um, a reform of the UK data protection regime going on and seeing how uh, this fare against uh, everything that we just saw. Uh, starting from the uh, report itself, this is divided into uh, four main uh, uh, sections. One is about the case studies. Uh, we therefore provide some examples of how, uh, in particular, three uh, public health programs that were run during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, have, um, uh, let's say, created problems with data protection legislation. In particular, uh, there were um, uh, certain, uh, let's say, shortcomings when it comes to compliance with data protection law. We later go in uh, uh, comparing the ICO to how uh, other data protection authorities uh, have uh, fared during the same period and seeing uh, and in there we see that fundamentally the SEO underperformed not only uh, according to what 
our expectations would be, but also about the, let's say, what the expectations of other people in other countries were. And we finally moved to the uh, data protection bill, where, uh, let's say, fundamentally we see that many of the uh, ground issues that uh, characterize the ICO failures in enforcing uh, uh, the general data protection regulation and therefore in protecting the public during that kind of time of crisis would probably be exacerbated by uh, the changes which have been introduced into the law. And we finally present what is um, uh, open rights group uh, solutions, pro 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 proposed solutions and recommendations uh, in this regard. So starting from the case studies, here we have a three uh, main uh, uh, public uh, health programs that were run at the time. The first one is uh, the test and trace system. So this was uh, the uh, general contact tracing uh, effort that the United Kingdom, as probably every country at the time, was doing and try to, uh, let's say, trace COVID cases and therefore isolate them before they could spread the virus to others. And in this regard, uh, uh, because of uh, legal correspondence that uh, Open Rights Group together with the Data Rights Agency, AWO, held at the time with the Department of Health and Social Care, we found out that um, uh, the program was run uh, uh, unlawfully, and in particular, the uh, let's say the Department of Health and Social Care uh, failed to produce a data protection impact assessment. Now, in data protection uh, uh, law, uh, data protection impact assessments, if you like, are a sort of um, a due diligence process, which is meant to uh, analyze risk in uh, uh, uses of personal data that present a high risk, either because of the sensitivity of the personal data which is involved in processing or because of the sheer scale of the program. And in this case, uh, it will check both boxes, right? I mean, like medical data, so highly sensitive uh, information about individuals together with, uh, let's say, uh, uh, data processing that uh, literally uh, captured the, the movements and, if you like, the social interactions of millions of individuals in the United Kingdom. And um, yes, exactly. This due diligence process is supposed to, uh, let's say, identify issues related to this. Uh, this eventually materialized in uh, uh, the test and trace program uh, uh, presenting significant, uh, uh, let's say, that, uh, security risk. And we will go into this uh, a bit uh, uh, later. Going to the second case study, this is instead about the uh, digital contact tracing app. This was uh, something that was supposed to complement the uh, traditional contact tracing by giving us an application for fundamentally keeping track of the people who will interact with and potentially uh, warning them in case uh, of an infection. And here in particular, the issue that came at hand is, uh, uh, let's say, the development and the deployment of the solution, how this fares against the uh, uh, the principle of necessity and data minimization under the uh, general data protection regulation. In uh, data protection law, you have a concept of uh, uh, necessity. So personal data should be used only and insofar it is uh, uh, necessary to achieve a given purpose. And this is, of course, the first step toward ensuring that uh, uh, there is no abuse in the system. But most importantly, and here you see the added value that this principle would have had in the deployment of the contact tracing app, which is a necessity is a balancing between the uh, benefits that something can provide on the one end, and on the other hand, the uh, well, the impact on the individuals, but also the effectiveness and the efficacy of this uh, measure. And at the time, digital contact tracing, of course, uh, was a very big question mark in terms of whether it could have worked or not. There were many studies that, that did uh, emphasize how uh, using a Bluetooth as a way to, uh, I mean, fundamentally measure distance between individuals could be problematic simply because Bluetooth wasn't born with this in mind. And as a result, uh, uh, let's say minimize, uh, and as a result, this of course means that you have to minimize the amount of personal data you collect and the risk that you take, exactly because it's an experimental, in a way, technology. And common sense tells that when you're doing an experiment, you should probably be, the, be a bit cautious about this. 
Uh, this is not what the government did at the time. The government uh, decided to uh, go on with uh, a centralized system of contact tracing. So let's say inside, instead of uh, the um, uh, route that many different countries took at the time that was to store personal data in the device that an individual would have, they wanted to create a central database to be somewhere in the United Kingdom where all the personal data and content tracing data of all the individuals that were using the system would be stored. And this, of course, would have uh, increased significantly the invasiveness and, if you want, also the risk of this uh, something bad happening to this data. Eventually, the decision was uh, uh, scrapped and the government made a U-turn, but by, that, by then uh, uh, the damage in a way was done and eventually the digital contact tracing system was rolled out with uh, significant delays. Um, finally, we come to the uh, NHS data store. This is a bit of an uh, omnibus uh, program that was launched to uh, fundamentally create a dashboard where personal data concerning the pandemic coming from different sources of the NHS could be brought together and analyzed to try to forecast, let's say, uh, pandemic trends and these sort of things. Um, there were, well, several issues with uh, uh, data protection legislation there in terms of uh, uh, the government uh, not being really uh, transparent about the uh, lawful basis that we're using to run this program and not being very transparent about the procurement process. And here in particular, you had Foxglove and uh, uh, Open Democracy making some very good investigative work that eventually uh, disclosed some uh, very worrying uh, uh, contracts with uh, uh, Amazon and with uh, Palantir that fundamentally lacked the meaningful safeguards for uh, the sub-processing of this information. Um, so what, let's say, so these are, let's say, the uh, issue that we saw. And what were the uh, impacts of this on individuals? Well, concerning test and trace, and here you see a bit the uh, materiality, if you like, of data protection law, uh, we had, uh, uh, let's say, the United Kingdom experienced uh, several uh, uh, data breaches and data misused. Contact tracing data was used by a member of hospitality venues to fundamentally harass uh, women that were coming to those venues. Uh, we had uh, volunteers that were uh, supporting the content tracing effort that uh, uh, either by mistake or uh, for other reasons shared uh, confidential patient information on uh, Facebook groups or via WhatsApp chats or a lot of, uh, let's say, channels that weren't supposed to be used for this purpose for obvious reasons. And I mean, like the most obvious one in terms of uh, what's the impact of not running a data protection impact assessment for this kind of operations is, uh, turns out most of the digital contact tracing system in the United Kingdom was resting upon a single big Excel sheet stored by the Department of Health and Social Care. And at a certain point, they reached the maximum amount of lines that you know Excel sheets can actually handle. And so they lost data about potentially uh, infectious individuals that simply couldn't be fit into the Excel sheet. So this is the kind of stuff that if they carried out a, a due diligence process under the data protection and impact assessment, they would probably be flagged as an element of risk, just to put it uh, bluntly. Um, Again, we go to the digital contact tracing app here as well. Uh, you have a situation where if, uh, let's say, uh, data protection was taken seriously from the beginning, uh, would have probably speeded up the, the uh, rollout of uh, digital contact tracing in the United Kingdom. And here we start seeing one of the uh, issues concerning the ICO, which is uh, concerning exactly digital contact tracing app. We have both the Norwegian Data Protection Authority and the um, French Data Protection Authority that were very uh, assertive in uh, fundamentally talking to the uh, to the government and to imposing certain data protection standards. And well, as a result, fundamentally, the United Kingdom was one of the latest country in the Europe in Europe at the time to uh, manage to deploy this system let alone that once it was finally deployed as you remember it, it was targeted with the pandemic uh, issue you know like you would receive a, 
uh, notifications, etc. And then the government switched it off because they were like, you know, people have to go to work and, and uh, other stuff. And finally, when it, go, when it comes to the uh, NHS data store and Palantir, uh, well, here you see that the problems concerning the uh, procurement and transparency of this process uh, have, in a way, stayed. Because um, uh, later on, uh, we know that uh, Pal uh, the government tried to award to Palantir a, a new contract for, uh, let's say, the provision of these uh, uh, data analytics services. Uh, it was challenged when people find out about this. And eventually, uh, now they are running a public uh, competition where, however, uh, competitors are required, uh, has a requirement for, you know, being uh, considered for this, to be willing to uh, create a system that fundamentally tra uh, transfers uh, the data that he collects to uh, the Palantir system. So uh, the bottom line is that Palantir is here to stay. And there are several problems there in terms of, uh, you know, Palantir is not exactly a data analytics company that works for uh, uh, trying to solve medical issues. Is therefore, uh, and is fundamentally a national survey is a, a contractor of the national surveillance agencies in the United States. He works on counter, counter terrorism, on a lot of things that don't really have a very close connection with the health data. Um, we come to uh, the ICO. How was this possible? Here, uh, I mean, there are several, let's say there are two main issues, I suppose, that emerge from the report. The first one is that the ICO uh, tendentially has a very, very weak uh, approach to enforcement. They uh, don't really like to uh, try to use their broader enforcement powers, and they usually try to uh, persuade people to comply. Problem is sometimes people don't want to comply. The other one, and this is a, a little more scary, it's a... Uh, uh, we saw that the ICO was uh, particularly stressed in pretty much every communication that they had either with us or with the public in uh, uh, emphasizing their role as critical friend of the government. Um, of course, here there is a problem concerning the independence of the Information Commissioner Office because the ICO is supposed to be an independent regulator and the reason of this independence is exactly that it shouldn't be scared to uh, take enforcement action against the government if the government is doing things which are not in line, in line with the law. But uh, here you can clearly see that uh, there was a problem in there and there was a constant, uh, uh, let's say, uh, yeah, fear by the regulator to fundamentally uh, take appropriate enfor enforcement action. And this is, a, I guess, a good way to go to the second part of uh, the, well, let's say the second half of the report, which is the Data Protection and Digital Information Bill. Because uh, here we have changes by the government to the structure of the Information Commissioner Office, which actually will be abolished and changed into what will take the name of an Information Commission, where uh, a number of uh, powers are given to uh, the Secretary of State to uh, fundamentally uh, interfere or influence the um, behavior of uh, the regulator. They have so the power to issue a statement of strategic priorities. They have powers to veto or to, uh, let's say, yeah, fundamentally prevent the uh, information commissioner from uh, laying a, a co code of practice before parliament uh, if the government does not approve with those code of practices. And there is also uh, a very convoluted um, procedure for uh, selecting the member of the board of this information commission that gives a significant discretion to the Secretary of State to uh, have an influence in this. And of course, uh, uh, this uh, means that um, if this reform were to pass, all of the issues that we experienced during the pandemic in terms of the government, uh, uh, well, in terms of the ICO being a little too friendly with the government will probably increase exactly because the opportunities for the Secretary of State to, uh, in a way, meddle with the Information Commissioner or even threaten, let's say, the Information Commissioner, uh, the Information Commission as an institution, have expanded significantly. And together with this, there are also changes uh, to the... Um, so to the statutory objectives of the ICO. Today, uh, a regulator is supposed to primarily enforce data protection law, which is what you would probably expect by a data protection authority. 
the government are introducing a, a lot of uh, secondary objectives and purposes and uh, fundamentally they are making the um, turning the uh, statutory objective of the information commission into something a lot more complex and here uh, I mean from the, like a there are fundamentally reports also by the Institute of Governments that show how uh, the clarity of the statutory function of an arm length body of an independent regulator is uh, a very important element in defining the efficacy and the efficiency of a regulator in enforcing the law. So this would also not help in terms of making the ICO or the Information Commission, as it will, talk, will be uh, called, a more assertive uh, data protection authority. And finally, there are other changes across uh, the board in data protection legislation, in particular, and in particular those re related to the accountability framework. So, to all those due diligence measures like data protection impact assessments, which um, uh, organizations are supposed to undertake before engaging with uh, high risk uh, data processing. Here, I mean, the changes are very technical, but bottom uh, bottom line is. Uh, uh, those requirements become mostly voluntary unless uh, you assess that a high risk to data processing is involved and the assessment of this high risk is left entirely to the organization compared to the current regime where fundamentally the law provides some prescri prescriptive requirements in terms of what is a large task, large scale data process processing or a high risk data processing and therefore in which situations you definitely need to uh, run this sort of uh, compliance exercises and this is uh, actually pretty relevant for the cases at stake because uh, most of these prescriptive requirements which are being removed by the regulation are prescriptive requirements that made it uh, absolutely clear in the three case studies of this report that those compliance uh, uh, measures were actually needed so by taking them away, you end up having a, you know, this uh, falling into the discretion of the government, whether this is useful or not. And as we mentioned in the government's in the report several times, the then Minister for Health of the United Kingdom uh, made a very scanting uh, comment on uh, in Parliament saying that uh, data protection impact assessment were just bureaucracy and it wouldn't be held back by this sort of uh, uh, nonsense, you know, these sort of things. And so we come to uh, what do we propose instead as Open Rights Group? Well, in terms of, um, uh, let's say, changes to uh, the uh, ICO, we of course uh, recommend to scrap the DPADIB, uh, the Data Protection Digital Information Bill, which is the UK Data Protection Reform, because fundamentally there is nothing useful in there, in particular in situations like this. But most importantly, uh, we propose to introduce instead the new uh, requirements to publish accountability documents. We propose to uh, move the responsibility for appointing the uh, information commissioner from the government to parliament. So making this a, a parliamentary appointment as opposed to a ministerial appointment exactly with the uh, objective of making the ICO more independent from the government, which we saw is something that we desperately need. We also propose to clarify the uh, statutory objective of the ICO, in particular by, uh, let's say, enshrining a case law that defines today the responsibility of the information commissioner into the legislation as opposed to, you know, like what the government are proposing. And finally, we uh, propose to implement Article 80.2 of the UK GDPR, uh, which um, is a provision that would allow uh, public interest organizations to act uh, on behalf and in the interest of the public when it comes to uh, lodging complaints or otherwise taking action toward the uh, uh, data protection and breaches of data protection law without the need of uh, obtaining uh, the authorization of every single individual, which is usually a compliant. A, a, big burden in terms of uh, making those uh, sort of public interest uh, actions uh, possible. Um, finally, okay, this is um, a bit technical, but let's say today there is a sort of a loophole in the way you can, uh, uh, let's say, scrutinize the information commissioner. 
And in particular, you have an information tribunal that can only deal with, uh, uh, let's say, procedural aspects of uh, how the ICO handled a complaint. And then you have co the normal court system that can deal with the substantial aspect. However, uh, let's say for various reasons, this system doesn't work very well. And it would be advisable to give to the information tribunal also the power to review the substance of ICO decisions, not only the, uh, let's say, procedural adherence to the rules. And this would increase a lot the accountability of the ICO toward the objective and impartial standards enshrined in legislation. And finally, we make recommendations to uh, the ICO as well, which include the uh, uh, let's say, carrying out uh, more assertive uh, audits of government departments, and most importantly, relying on more assertive uh, means of enforcement. Something that we saw very recently concerning the ICO is exactly that the ICO is relying a lot on uh, uh, reprimands, which is, um, let's say, a glorified uh, uh, term for saying very hungry letter that are sent to companies by saying, uh, you shouldn't really do this anymore. Uh, and other recommendations that we do is about developing a concrete system for oversight during emergency situations. So let's say let's try not to uh, be unprepared for the next time something bad happens. And uh, yeah, so fundamentally uh, also having a wider and for uh, a wider involvement of the public uh, in the functioning and generally speaking in the feedback to what the ICO are doing. And um, Yes, with this, I hope that I gave, a, uh, gave you a hint of what this uh, report is about, and I hand this over to Abigail. Thanks, Mariano. That was really great. Um, yeah, I want to open the floor for questions now from anyone who's here on Zoom or anyone who's watching the live stream on YouTube. Um, we've already had a few questions come in, so I'll start with you, Martin. There was a question on YouTube asking about how many of the, the contractors that work with health data have government connections? Um, and on top of that question, I wanted to ask you to elaborate a little more on something you mentioned to me earlier. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about Palantir in the news and a lot of concerns about Palantir that are well founded. But, you know, you've mentioned that, you know, Palantir is just one company and part of a much larger problem. There's a lot of companies with less well-known names that we should also be concerned about? You're on mute, Martin. The first part of the question I think is very interesting and it would be useful if somebody perhaps did a bit of research on that. I, I'm afraid I don't know. Uh, of course, we know that Simon Stevens uh, used to work for United Health, so there's one big connection. We know that Matthew Swindells, who's not actually, he's not political, but he's actually uh, at, at the chair of uh, all the acute um, trusts in Northwest London. He used to work for Cerna. So there are, uh, you know, there are connections not only with politicians but also with uh, people within the NHS I, be I believe that the one of the ministers uh, is, is it the minister of social care used to work with McKinsey so again these corporations um, infiltrate everywhere and and we know that a lot of people do when they retire from politics, if they've had a health portfolio, some of them have gone to work in healthcare companies. So again, they must have had links and and so on. So it is, I think it is a big problem. And the second bit about Palantir, Palantir is an horrendous organization. And, and I think that's been made public and is well known and people you know there are fights against palantir um it, it appears that government is not going to let go of them uh, i don't i don't know when they're actually going to declare who's got the um federated data platform contract uh, i thought it was due but it hasn't happened but things just seem to keep happening they've been testing things with palantir with the rapid data collection and so on to check that all the Palantir software is 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 working. 
and I believe it has because I think they're they're asking people to send data to Palantir now. Um, but there are there's a huge number of uh, big corporations um, signed up to the the systems framework, um, and you know these are these are bigger organisations than Palantir. Many of them do have health expertise. If you look at Centene. Centene is an, an enormous organization in America, and it concentrates on people with Medicaid um, um, who, you know, Medicaid is not overly generous. Um, Abia, you, you know, America, American health system probably better than me, but I believe it's not overly generous. And yet no. somehow, okay, somehow, uh, uh, Centene is able to make billions of dollars of profit out of Medicaid. And how do they do that? Well, they they cut they cut services, they cut corners, they, you know, and and all this thing is is you know is seen as innovation. And they wish to bring their business model to this country. And you know, if if state funding is limited, then you know they will be able to make money out of it uh, in general practice um so, that, so that's worrying you've got big companies like um ibm as well um who are heavily involved and they've also had um bad pasts in that they were i believe they were involved in in nuclear weapon development so it's not just palantir uh that is bad the, the problem about sort of you know, almost demonizing Palantir is it it might put the other corporations, might make them look as though they're better and more acceptable. They're not. That you know, the only reason that these companies have bought their way into the NHS as you know, large profit-making companies is is that they want to make money out of what they do. And the, the, you know, in the past, when private companies have come into the NHS, uh, such as PFIs and and even the uh, the companies that provide elective care, they they rip us the public off. And there's a lot of evidence if you go to the CHPI website, um, the Center for Health and the Public Interest website, you can see their reports on on uh, elective care and their reports on uh, uh, residential social care, how the public is being ripped off by these companies. And, and this is a worry. There's so many of them sort of waiting for these systems to, to be set up and, and to start running them. Thanks, Martin. That's a really powerful reminder. Um, Mariano, we have one for you from Joe. Um, they asked, do you think we would have avoided the various data protection breaches that you refer to if, for example, a DPIA had been created? Well, I mean, I would say if a DPIA was carried out, definitely we wouldn't uh, have had uh, the uh, test and trace system be run on Excel sheet. But in general, I would say that, uh, yes, data protection impact assess assessment are meant if they are conducted properly, exactly to uh, prevent and to mitigate those issues. For instance, uh, once you decide to include uh, hospitality venues into uh, digital contact tracing and to fundamentally, uh, you know, like have hospitality workers uh, collecting the contact, you know, the names and phone numbers of uh, every customer that visits the premise, uh, I like a, a reasonable question to ask yourself would be exactly how do we prevent, you know, like a random uh, waiter or, you know, like a random hospitality worker to you know collect this data use this data for their own private proposals and to be honest uh, uh, during the pandemic we did see examples of uh, companies and hospitality venues that did this you know like for instance by creating uh, uh, pieces of papers that you would put in a box so that you know they get in but they can't get out or you know like for those who had more uh, let's say resources uh, uh, creating maybe a computerized system to uh, let's say record this information as as opposed to using a fragmentary glory book. 
but uh, uh, the problem is this was left entirely to the initiative and to the uh, discretion in a way of um, uh, hospitality uh, or uh, hospitality companies to figure out and uh, let's say data protection impacts assessments and would have been a good way to for the government to identify for instance the need of guidance the need of instructions to be issued to the people that were supposed to collect this information so I mean like of course uh, we can't say this would have prevented uh, the issues that have arisen from those uh, uh, data breaches or data misuses at 100 percent but it would have definitely mitigated these issues uh, uh, significantly same goes with the uh, uh, the volunteer workers I mean like the issues that have arisen from there are I would say pretty uh pretty lame in a way I mean, you know like it's you can clearly see that the problem in there was that uh these people didn't receive any training into how to use the tools that they were given in order to you uh, conduct contact tracing again let's say identifying uh, staff training as a way to uh, reduce risk in data processing is a sort of a common uh, recommendation at this time in data protection impact assessment to uh, reduce the sort of risks so uh, yeah we come back to the point uh, these are pretty I mean I would say it's not very difficult uh, uh, questions that should have been asked in there it's just that nobody did it Thanks, Mariano. And then this question from Stuart on YouTube uh, can be for either of you, but he asks, is it time for a code of conduct for politicians that deals with uh, conflicts of interest in terms of data? Well, I mean, I will say coming from a country like Italy, I think that uh, conflict of interest in general is a problem when it comes to politicians. And when it comes also to other uh, uh, members of institutions and independent authorities, and this is why uh, ensuring that uh, the integrity of institutions as a whole is actually a pretty important uh, uh, step to take in every state or democracy that wants to uh, work uh, under the framework of the rule of law. And data is probably one of those, but it's not the only one. Um, yeah. We had a, a conflict of data. I believe that one of the a member of the House of Lords was um, chair of a, an investment company that was going to be investing in digital and data, and was also seeking for a, a minimum spend by government five percent. I think they said of budget should be going to data protection, and he had to give up. He was found out and had to give up the chairmanship. So I think it is an issue and there's a lot of money. There's going to be an awful lot of money. This presently is a lot of money going to be made uh, from, from digitalization and, and, and opening up the uh, NHS market, as they call it. Thanks, Martin. And then we have a, a bit of a longer question from Stephen. Um, he says, should org be campaigning a much wider position that any health data gathered via the NHS or other state related avenues should be gathered, stored, processed and anonymized solely by the state without any outsourcing altogether, both on the argument of value for money, if these private companies are ripping us off for the NHS to do this themselves, but also that there's more accountability um, for misuse of that data if it's an elected state that you can take issue with rather than an unelected private company. So I go first with that one. Um, ben Goldacre was asked to write a, a review of all of this, and and, and he did, and it, it was well, well, I'm greeted, but it wasn't taken up. His solution was to keep all data in a few trusted research environments and not allow it to be released from those environments so that anyone that wanted to use it had to go to the research environment to use it and so that they could be uh, monitored and, and the data could be kept safe. Um, Clearly, the data that's used for functioning of the NHS, such as the shared care records, goes only to professionals who are registered, and it's read-only. You can't do anything with it. So, in effect, that's reasonably safe. 
but government didn't take him up on this. That there, there are some trusted research environments, but it seems that they're basically being used by public researchers who really we're not that worried about. But what what Ferris has set up is is secure data environments, they're called, but there's so many of them all over the place. There's regional, sub-regional, uh, there's going to be now the federated data platform as well. Every ICS will ha has its will have its own SDE. Northwest London's been operating for a while using you know real time data, and it's and it's allowed to leave. It's allowed to move around. So they all have their own data usage committees, and it's going to be incredibly difficult to keep an eye on it all. You know, but Goldacre solution. People wouldn't have liked it, but it would have been safe. Um, that was great, Martin. Thank you. And then a question for Mariano. Um, we've seen that the use of non-binding reprimands by the ICO has increased. Uh, the ICO's commissioner, John Edwards, has also spoken out in favor of the new data bill recently, even as civil society has expressed serious concerns about the bill and its impact on the ICO. Um, do you have any thoughts about this trend that we've been seeing? You know, you've been working in this space for a long time now. You know, do you think that the ICO's approach has worsened over the years? Is this something new? Well, I mean, speaking in terms of um, how the ICO enforces the law, um, well, first of all, you know, like we're talking like if I were, uh, if I had spent this amount of time in the United Kingdom, I've been here for three years, right? So it's a uh, uh, a relatively short amount of time but there have always been problems in terms of uh, how the ICO enforces the law and in general uh, uh, how these uh, let's say sort of a uh, non-adversarial cooperative approach that they take can easily be gamed by uh, organizations that don't really have an interest in uh, comply with the law uh, coming to the ICO more in general I do know by way of uh, studying a bit the institutions uh, in the United Kingdom and the ICO is one of them. That, uh, I mean, like the history of the, and the issue of the independence of the ICO starts from uh, very afar, who used to be called the Information Registrar, it was under the Ministry of Justice because at the time it was mainly working with uh, uh, access to government information and the government wasn't very, of course, very keen to have an independent authority that decides what uh, uh, information the government must reveal. So like uh, they were a bit scared probably about this thing. Um, throughout um, uh, many years, the ICO started to gain some distance from the government. After this Snowden revelation, the uh, responsibility for the ICO was transferred from the Minister of Justice to the CMS at the time. We did have some uh, oversight uh, functions that were transferred uh, to Parliament. And we did have Parliament uh, constantly uh, complaining about uh, the fact that the ICO was a ministerial appointment rather than a, uh, let's say, parliamentary one for various reasons. I guess the, uh, let's say, worrying development that we see nowadays is that this process of, uh, let's say, gaining more uh, arm's length from the government has in a way reversed. And we are seeing that the ICO is clearly becoming much more dependent and much more close to the government. This comes a lot from, uh, well, what uh, we heard in terms of, uh, you know, like uh, John Edwards basically, uh, let's say, working as a government salesman and going around trying to sell a data protection reform that is difficult to sell. But also in terms in particular of what the legislation proposes, which uh, uh, attacks uh, structural issues of independence of a data protection authority. So like the appointment process, the determination of the salaries of some member of this uh, commission, the issuing of strategic priorities, the issuing of uh, some of the code of practices that the ICO can issue. Uh, this is, uh, I mean, this is no joke. I mean, in a way it's uh, uh, things that uh, really, really uh, are incompatible with the idea of uh, an independent data protection, uh, an independent authority in general, as we are uh, used to think of one. And um, I, mean, I mean, it's obviously not a very good news that that protection authority is going this way because um, the reason we started to have independent data protection authorities is exactly that the impact of data processing on individuals, the impact of uh, the data collection that, you know, living in a digital society has. 
Uh, more recently, the expansion of uh, you know artificial intelligence and all the risks that are coming from this would require uh, uh, stronger institutions exactly to address the harms and in a way to keep the actors which are deploying those systems in check. And of course, uh, the moment you start weakening the institutions which are supposed to hold these people to account, this is a problem for us all. Thanks, Mariano. And, you know, as we're running out of time here, I'll just pose one last question because I think uh, this one from the chat is, is a good one to end on. Uh, but someone asked, how could one ensure that none of their data gets shared with commercial third parties? I remember opting out when the FT ran the NHS data stare data sharing story a while back, but that may have been shared now anyways. So what steps should or could someone take when seeing their GP to ensure that no data is being shared? Um, when seeing your GP, uh, well, you can certainly ask your GP not to put your data out, but um, if it doesn't go into the shared care record, there are you know, they quite rightly they say it, it. You know, it it could be problematic personally for you um, if you you know because the idea of the shared care record is so that if you do get go into hospital elsewhere, have problems that then people can actually to read that record. And the the other problem is that uh, as I presented, even when people have opted out. So even if the GP could organise it so that the opt-out happens, the national opt-out is, is actually done via the internet rather than through your GP. But even if you do that and you believe you're opted out, it seems that it's not acted on. So that is what's got to happen. If people do opt out, the opt-out has to be honoured. And how you actually police that, well, you've, you've got to, as you know you've got to use the law and 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 the law has to work and this is what org is all about isn't it enforcing the law thanks martin uh mariano martin before i wrap up and give some final thoughts to either of you have anything you want to add Perfect. All right. Well, everyone, thank you so much for attending tonight. Um, obviously, the protection of our public health data is such an important topic. And, you know, I really believe this report is one step in moving the ICO and government closer to accountability for both data protection breaches during the pandemic, but also ensuring proper privacy and data protection being implemented in the future. Um, Martin and Mariano, as well as Pam and James and all the other org staff that contributed to the report, thank you all for your hard work. Um, if you're interested in Keep Our NHS's Public's work, you can head to their website. Um, additionally, you can head to org's website and find our campaigning page there, um, where you can read the report and join our campaigning against the Data Protection and Digital Information Bill. We're going to be continuing our work on this in earnest this year. And we'll have more events and actions that you can take part in. Uh, Mariano and I are also available via email at mariano at openrightsgroup.org or abigail at openrightsgroup.org. So feel free to reach out to us. Um, but that concludes our event for the night. Thanks again, everyone, and have a great evening. Thank you.